We're going to be talking about personal forgiveness tonight. <clears throat> God really opened my eyes one day to see how many born-again Christians were living defeated lives. I mean, completely defeated lives because of the consequences of past sins that they already had forgiven. They'd already repented, but they were still living under those, those past sins. Now, we all have past sins, but because of the blood of Jesus, we were never, God never intended us to live an under par defeated life because of those sins. He never intended that. And that's why Jesus shed his blood. That's what it was for, you know. Now, there's so many Christians who need to hear this teaching, really, so many. Uh, the shed blood of Jesus is not just to get us into heaven and leave us defeated while we live out this life. You know, that's not what it's for. And so I'm hoping tonight that we can really grab hold of this. I think everybody here knows it, but uh, we, we need to share it with other people. Every born-again Christian should memorize this scripture in, in uh, uh, Psalm 51, starting with verse 1. It says, Be gracious to me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the greatness of thy compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Okay, it doesn't say here, forgive my sins. That's not what it's saying. He's saying, blot out my transgressions. When our sins are blotted out, that means that they're gone, totally gone. And then it goes on to say, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Okay, when something is cleansed, it's gone. And I, I don't think most Christians really realize that. For I know my transgressions and my sins are ever before me. Against thee and thee only I have sinned and I've done what's evil in thy sight. So that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge me. Okay, this is telling us that we deserve every bad thing that's coming, and we do. But thank goodness, it doesn't stop there. It goes on. And it says, but if you purify me, I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide thy face from my sins. And again, he, blot out, blot out my sin. Cover, he doesn't say cover my sin. He said, blot out my sin. Okay, so it goes on, create within me a clean heart, O God, so that I will not be cast away from thy presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. And when you do that, it says, then I'll be able to teach transgressors thy ways and sinners will be converted to thee. Then he goes on in verse 16, he says, Lord, if you delighted in sacrifice, I would have given you a sacrifice. They were saying, I, I'd have given that. That's what you wanted. But that's not you, what you wanted from me. When a person comes with a broken spirit and a contrite heart over what they've done, David said, that is the sacrifice that you're looking for. Okay, Lord, when someone comes to you broken because of their sin, we know he, you'll never turn them away. Okay, now this is a perfect picture of repentance and God's restoration. If you want that perfect picture, repentance and God's restoration, you get it right here in Psalm 51. Now, when we come to God in true repentance, our sins are not just covered by the blood. Verse 9 tells us that our sins are blotted out. You need to mark that in your Bible because they're gone. Years ago, I had this girl. She didn't go to our church, but she called, and she told me she was getting ready to divorce her husband. He had just recently become a Christian, and there was another man that she was intending to marry well, her husband was begging her to give him another chance. He said, let's start a Christian home. We'll have a Christian home now. And I asked her, I said, how on earth do you justify the fact that you're going to leave your husband and marry somebody else? How do you justify that? And these were her very words. After I divorce him and after I get remarried, then I'm going to repent. And you know what? That's the opinion of a lot of people. You know, I, I know I'm doing this. It's not quite right, but I'm, I'm going to repent. I, I'm going to get uh-uh. So what I've described to you, that's not repentance. We can't manipulate God with our reasoning. We can't manipulate him with our clever plans. We have to come to a place where we hear God and do exactly, do it exactly like he lines it out in the scripture. And what he's looking for is a broken and a contrite spirit. That's what God's looking for. And when we come in true repentance and we're, we really are brokenhearted over our sin, there's going to be a determination on our part not to ever break God's heart again. Anytime we sin and we repent, there should be something inside of us that just said, God, I never want to do that to you again. Now, I'm not saying that we can't be forgiven a second time. Of course we can. But I'm saying there needs to be a real true desire in our heart that we don't ever want to do it again. God knows our struggle. 
He knows we're going to have struggle with the, with the flesh. He knows that it's, we're not going to be completely over it on this side of heaven. So he knows that we're going to fall. He expects that. But he still wants there to be a broken heart when we do. He wants us to come to a place where we're brokenhearted over the fact that we've hurt him and have a determination in our heart. Lord, I never want to hurt you again like this. I never want to do it again. There needs to be something inside of us that's just repelled by our sin. Now, every time we come to God with a broken heart, he's fine-tuning us. And what he's doing, he's bringing us into the image of his son. That's what it's all about. Our part is to desire with everything in us to please him and continually want to be more like Jesus. That should be the cry of our heart. Lord, I want today to be more like Jesus than I have been. That, that needs to be something where we're continually growing. And not run from him when we sin, but run to him. You know, I've noticed so many times that when a person sins, so many times they'll quit going to church, they'll quit reading their Bible, they'll pull way back. And that's exactly the opposite of what God's telling us to do. He's saying that when we sin, we need to run right into his arms, not run from him. Okay, what about false guilt? False guilt, guilt is the pain that a lot of people live with even after they've truly repented. I see so many Christians in false guilt. I know a lot of people who've repented, but that false guilt torments them day and night. Now, that's because they have never come to the understanding that the blood of Jesus, it doesn't just remove just remove the sin when we've prayed, but it literally removes it for all time and eternity. It removes, removes the sin, it removes the guilt, and it removes the consequences. I mean, that should be, Christians should shout when they hear that, you know. And they, that person has never come to understand what David was saying when he said, if you will wash me, Lord, I'll be whiter than snow. That is a true statement. When God washes us and we've truly repented, we literally become white as snow. Okay, let's look for a moment, just a minute, at the difference between conviction and condemnation. Now, the Holy Spirit convicts, the devil condemns. I want to say that again because I want you to get that down inside of you, that it's the Holy Spirit who convicts us. It's the devil who condemns us. And we need to come to a place where we never confuse the two. Satan has been called the accuser of the brethren. And he continually accuses and condemns us and puts guilt on us all the time, try to keep us under this false condemnation. So how can we know the difference between God's conviction and Satan's condemnation? A lot of people don't even know the difference. Now, if you will sincerely analyze your feelings, it's really going to be clear to you. You, you can know the difference every time. <clears throat> I'm going to give you two clues. God's conviction is normally always very, very specific. You don't have to guess what, uh, what you've done wrong. When God's conviction comes over you, you know exactly what you've done. You know, there, there's no guessing, you know. But it's different with condemnation. With condemnation, there's usually always just a vague sense of unrest. You know, feeling like, well, I've done something wrong, but I don't quite know exactly what I've done. You know, when God's conviction comes, though, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt what you've done wrong. You know it, you know, because the Holy Spirit goes right to the problem. He points it out. He puts his finger on it, and it hurts. <laughs> when, when, when the Holy Spirit comes and touches that sin, you know it beyond a shadow of a doubt. But when it's the condemnation of the enemy, many times it's just going to be a general uneasiness, you know, a feeling like something's not quite right. You know, but you don't know exactly what you've done. You know you're missing the mark somewhere, but you really don't know exactly where you've gone wrong. And so you keep praying, and you say, Lord, what, is, what have I done? And you feel uneasy, and you feel uns unsettled. Okay, that's how condemnation feels, and you constantly feel that there's something not quite right. But I'm going to tell you what, it's not so with your, uh, your conviction from the Holy Spirit, because you know exactly what it is. So any time that you're feeling that, oh, I don't know what I've done, but I just don't feel like I've done, something's wrong, stop right then and know that's coming from the enemy. And it, it's not the, the conviction of the Holy Spirit, that's the condemnation that's coming from the enemy. Another clue, you can know the difference between conviction and condemnation if you'll look at the motivation behind it. <clears throat> God's reason to motivate us is to mature us and draw us closer to him. That's what it's all about. And it's, a, it's motivated by a desire now to put us in a position so that he can restore us and bless us. That's the whole reason that he convicts us. 
He wants to restore us and he wants to remove all of the sin and, and put us in a position where he can bless us. Now, this is always the motivation behind God's conviction. So we don't have to fear God's conviction. It hurts, but we need to thank God for it because that's what he's doing. He's trying to get us in a position so that he can bless us. But Satan's condemnation now is totally different. Satan's motivation is always to get us to give up, to get discouraged, and to throw in the towel. And I, I see so many people, and, and that's where they are. They've sinned, and they just feel like, I, I just, I'm ready to give up, you know. I, I just can never do it right. Okay, that's the condemnation of the enemy, because he's not trying to get us back to God. He's trying to get us give up, throw in the towel. Now, all you have to do is ask those two questions, and you know instantly if you're under conviction or if you're under condemnation. So ask yourself, <clears throat> Does what I'm feeling make me want to get it right and go on with God? Or does it make me just want to give up and throw in the towel? You have your answer right there. Okay, what about the guilt over some specific past sin where you've truly repented and you know, but you're still feeling such deep regret? A lot of people are still in such regret over something they did 10 years ago. They've repented, but they're still under so much condemnation. Okay, that brings me now to a very important revelation that I want you to take home tonight. There are very few Christians who ever <clears throat> even begin to understand all that's involved in the God kind of forgiveness. I want you to think just a moment. <clears throat> Have you ever asked yourself what God is actually saying when he uses the words and says, I forgive you? So many times we've never even really stopped to realize what it means when the God of the universe looks at us, speaks to us, and says, I, I forgive you. I forgive you. Have we really even thought about that? Because that is something that we need to realize what a masterpiece that is. You know, what a gift that is. And often we've not even stopped to consider what that truly means. In Romans 5 verse 8, God demonstrated his love for us by dying for us while we were still sinners. While we were still out there in the world doing our own selfish thing, that's when Christ died for us. You know, it's important for us to realize that he didn't wait for us to change before he offered his love and forgiveness. He offered his love and his forgiveness while we were still right in the middle of our sin. And the only way back is to do it God's way. You know, people are trying all the time to get right with, in God's eyes, but what they're trying, how they're trying to do it is by works righteousness. If I do enough good things, then I, God's going to love me. And that is coming straight from the pit of hell. And it will never work until we do it God's way. And his way is so easy. In 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21, it says, He who knew no sin literally became sin that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. God's way is so easy. He did it for us. He bore it for us so that we could be forgiven. And we have to realize that when Jesus Christ took that sin on Calvary's cross, he literally broke the power of sin off of us. Sometimes we don't realize that there is a power force over us that causes people to sin. And when Christ went to the cross, he broke that power, the power source off of us. But very few Christians have even stopped to realize that the power of sin was broken off of us the minute we accepted Jesus. Very few people realize that when we accept Jesus, we instantly became righteous. We became the righteousness of God the moment that we received Christ. Now, as long as a Christian is still feeling unworthy, as long as they're still feeling guilty, they're going to keep sinning because down on the inside, they don't have any hope. And so this, they'll keep sinning as long as they're feeling unworthy. And that's because they don't understand the God kind of forgiveness. Now, the world has two signs that we hear so often. In fact, the world has pretty much accepted these as truth. The world says, I can forgive, but I can't forget. You hear that all the time. The world says he has made his bed, and he'll just have to lie in it. Okay, in other words, they're saying, well, he's, he's done wrong, and so he's just going to have to pay the consequences. That's all there is to it. Now, we've heard those two things so often that it sounds like truth, but both of these statements are completely unscriptural. After true repentance has come, we've been cleansed from that sin, completely cleansed. But we're never going to be able to understand that until uh, we just come to a place where we just make the choice that we're going to believe God's word. And when we start saying, God, I'm going to believe your word. You tell me that I'm cleansed. I'm going to believe you. And as we say that and believe it, 
and speak it, it'll start happening on the inside of us. Now, 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural mind of man will never be able to understand the things of God. Our natural mind, we can't do that. And if we're trying to understand the God kind of forgiveness with our natural mind, you can just forget it because you'll never be able to understand it. It's so far beyond us that it's, there's no way to understand it. Uh, and we can't understand the next scripture with our natural mind either in Romans 8, 1 and 2. Because it says, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus because the law of life that comes through repentance and comes through forgiveness has set us free from the law of sin and death. The law of life in Jesus had set us free because the debt has been paid. Christ paid the debt for us, so the debt's gone. But do we fully understand that word free? Sometimes we don't realize when God says, I've set you free, you know, we need to realize that that is, is beyond our natural thinking. We have to receive that in, by the Spirit of God. Some, many times we forget that we've been set free, and we need to say that phrase over and over and over until we realize, I've been set free from sin. I've been set free from death. I've been set free from the consequences of sin. I've been set free from everything that led me up to the sin. And once I put it under the blood of Jesus, it's gone. It's blotted out. Now, Jesus prophesied, God prophesied that over 500 years before it happened. Now, he would not have prophesied this 500 years ahead of time if he didn't really want us to know what he was saying. So I want us to look at it in the Amplified Bible because it was so important to God for us to understand the God kind of forgiveness that 500 years ahead of time he prophesied it so that when Christ came, we would already have that in our spirit and we'd be able to reach out and receive this gift because this is a gift that our mind can't even conceive what a gift this is. Isaiah 53, 5, uh, it's talking about Jesus. It says, Jesus was it, it says he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our guilt and chastisement uh, and the punishment that was needful for us to obtain peace and well-being fell on him, saying it fell on Jesus, and by his stripes were healed and made whole. God was saying, I'm going to take the sin and I'm going to pay for it by my own blood on the cross. He said, I'm going to take the guilt. You don't have to worry. Not, uh, I'm going to take the guilt as well and I'm going to take the consequences or I'm going to take the punishment. I'm going to take it on myself. And he did that by dying in our place. And after Jesus went to the cross and did exactly what he said that he was going to do, it's reiterated in scripture after scripture all through the New Testament. And I want us to look at several of these fulfillments. In Hebrews 9, 22 in the Amplified, it says, With the shedding of blood, there is, and he starts naming what came with the shedding of blood, the re release from the sin. The sin's gone. It's not something that we have to keep thinking about and repenting over and over. If we've truly repented, that sin is gone. And he said there's also a release from the guilt. We no longer have to feel the guilt. And there's a release now from the due and the merited punishment. In other words, we're free from the punishment that we deserve because Christ has already taken it. He's saying, I took care of the sin. I took care of the guilt for you. I took care of the punishment for you. Therefore, there's no punishment coming now because of that sin, no matter how big the sin was. And some people say, well, I, I have so many sins. My sin was so great. There's no way I can be forgiven. That's not what the Bible says. Man could never have done that for himself. But <clears throat> it's not ours automatically. We have to accept all of this, everything that Jesus did. We have to accept it by faith. And if we don't accept it by faith, we don't get it. That, that's the secret of accepting by faith what Christ did for us. And that's just a matter of choosing. Lord, I choose to believe. You said that you received it for me, you took it for me, and I choose to believe it. That He made it so simple. God hasn't made anything in his word hard. He made it so simple. No one on this earth has to go to hell, no matter how evil their sin was. We have a, a man right now that <clears throat> uh, my cousin's working with him, and he said, my sin's too great. I, I'm not even, even going to think about repenting because I know I'm going to hell anyway. And no matter how many times they go and try to talk to him, he's just he's locked in. And I thought, God, thank you that somebody is going to get his attention to realize he doesn't have to pay for his sin. 
Can you imagine God doing something for us that we don't have to pay for our sins? I mean, that should be something where we're shouting every day, thanking God. That's the most precious gift he could have given us. But it's not automatic. You know, we have to accept that gift that Christ took it for us, and we have to receive it and accept the fact that, Christ, you did it for me. So I want to live the rest of my life serving you. In Joel 2.25, God said, I will even <clears throat> return the years that the canker worm has eaten. In other words, God says that he'll restore back the years that we missed out on because of our sin. That's awesome. I mean, we sinned, we, we caused a lot of problems to come on us, and God says, I'll even restore those years back. Now, our natural mind cannot understand that, but that is something God promises that all of that can be restored back to us. Our, our natural mind can't receive that. We can't understand that. We have to understand that with our spirit. Colossians 2, 13 and 14. You could, you could spend days meditating on just this one scripture, but this truth is all through the New Testament. But in Colossians 2, 13 and 14, in the Amplified Bible, you who were dead in your sins, God has brought you back to life together with Christ, having freely forgiven you for all your transgressions. I mean, every time we read that, we should be shouting. God has freely forgiven us of all of our transgressions, all of our sins. And then it goes right on to say, having canceled and blotted out and wiped away the handwriting of the note with its legal decrees and demands, which was in force and stood against us and is hostile toward us. This note with its regulations, its decrees, and its demands, he has set it aside. And he has completely cleared it out of our way, nailing it to his cross. These are things that we need to be shouting about when we read this. When you're reading your Bible at home and you read some of this, I mean, don't just sit there quietly. I mean, start shouting. Thanking God, this is a gift that, that our minds can't even take in. And that's saying that there was a legal note against us. There was a debt that had to be paid. There were demands on that note. And we're totally guilty. And the penalty for that sin has to be paid. And we had to suffer the consequences and endure the punishment. And the punishment was death. So, I mean, that was ours. That's all we had to look forward to. It had to be. It was a legal note and no way to get around it. But Jesus came in and he just paid the note in full. Do we ever stop and, th and, and let ourselves just think what Christ did for us? Do we ever stop and just fall on our face and say, God, you know, th this, is, this is precious. This is so wonderful. And it was no easy payment because he paid it at an unbelievable price. No one can even imagine the horrible death that he had on the cross. But when he took that punishment for us, the debt was canceled because it had been paid. The debt had been paid. Now, the Bible said that Jesus took the punishment for us and literally blotted out the handwriting of the note, blotted it out off the paper. Uh, have you ha ever had a piece of paper with uh, ink written on it? Now, I'm not talking about ballpoint. I'm talking about back in my day when we had pen and ink, you know, and you could write in ink and all of a sudden, if you got that paper wet and it wiped across your page, it wiped all that ink off the paper. Well, that's exactly what he's saying here. He wiped the handwriting off the note. He just wiped it off. Okay, that's shouting ground. He didn't say that he came and took everything away except the consequences. That's not what he said. The Bible said that he came in and wiped it all away. In Micah 7, 19, it tells us that he puts our sin and our guilt and our consequences, the sin, the guilt, and the consequences in the depths of the sea. Now, scientists are still trying to find uh, the bottom of the ocean in some places, you know, and God says, I put that sin down in that depth of the sea. In Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our transgressions from us. And the east and the west, they never come together. God removed our sins not as far as the north from the south, because you can go be in the south and go north, and you'll finally get to the north. But he moved our sins for us as far as the east is from the west, because the east and the west never meet. Psalm 103, verse 1 through 5, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits. God is constantly trying to tell us, don't forget the benefits. I've given you some unbelievable benefits, but don't forget the benefits. He said, I, I pardon all your iniquities. 
I've healed all your diseases. I'm going to say that again. He said, I've healed all your diseases. Do we believe that? Have we even taken that in? He said, I've re redeemed your life from the pit. I've crowned you with loving kindness and compassion. I've satisfied your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. I mean, look at that. We're told here not to forget all these benefits. Okay, I want you to think of the benefits that he just named here. God's saying, I'm pardoning all of your iniquities, all of your sins. All we have to do is repent. And he said, I'm healing all of your diseases. Have we ever stopped to realize that God has promised, I'm healing all of your diseases? I'm redeeming your life from the pit of hell. We don't have to go to hell, in other words. He said, I'm crowning you with loving kindness and compassion. That means he's pouring his love and his kindness on our head. He's crowning us with that loving kindness and, and that compassion. He's compassionate with us. And then it says, and I'll renew your youth. Now, these are promises. These are gifts from the God of the universe. But they have to be received by faith. Those gifts are out there, but they're not ours until we take them, until we receive them by faith. Now, I don't know how many Christians who are receiving these promises, who are receiving all of them. To be real honest, I've looked at churches and people and Christians, and I see very few Christians who are receiving all these benefits. I, I just don't see them being taken and, and, and put into their life and being acted upon. And these promises, they don't happen if, these, if they're not received by faith. You know, if, if a person doesn't take that promise and choose to believe it and choose to walk in it, it's really not doing them any good. Every morning we should be thanking God by saying, God, I thank you that you're pardoning. You've pardoned all my sins when I repent. You're, you've taken my sins. You've taken my iniquities. And you've, because you've taken the sin, you've taken all the consequences. I don't have to bear the consequences. We should spend 30 minutes just praising God over that uh, when we're confessing that to him each morning. And then we come, need to come and say, Lord, there's not a sickness or a disease that comes against me that you're not willing to take it off of me and heal me completely if I just believe it. Do we believe that? That's God's promise. It's in the word. It's his promise to us. But do we believe that there's not a sickness or a disease that can come against us that God has not taken it and uh, we don't have to bury it ourselves? Lord, I thank you that I never have to fear hell. I have Jesus, so I never have to fear hell. I know a lot of Christians who still are in fear that they might end up in hell. You know, uh, I thank you every day, Lord, that I have your loving kindness and your compassion. Instead of being hating ourselves when we, when we sin and running and pulling away from God, we need to stop and repent, get it under the blood, and say, God, your loving kindness and your compassion I can't, I can't even describe it, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. I've never heard anyone really claiming those things and receiving them by faith. Now, I've heard a lot of people who will read them, but I've never seen anybody who actually reached out and took every one of those and, and appropriated them to their life. They may read the scripture, but I don't see many that grab hold of it and expect it to happen, expect those things to be a part of their life. And these are kind of like unclaimed promises. You know, the government has money that belongs to people that's never been claimed. Every once in a while, you can look at the Internet, and they will advertise this money that's unclaimed, that belongs to different people, and it's never been claimed. But that's nothing to compare to these promises that belong to those of us who are God's children, and yet we've left those unbelievable promises unclaimed. They're there, and yet we haven't taken them and appropriated them and started walking in them many times. And they're just sitting in our heavenly bank account waiting while we're still bearing the guilt of our, our repented sins. Most of us, when we know we've sinned, we've repented, but many times we're still bearing the guilt. But he said, I've removed that guilt once you've sinned. And uh, uh, I, I see so many Christians that are still laboring under every kind of sickness and disease. They expect to be sick. They don't expect uh, to uh, be protected from sickness because they know Jesus. They don't, they don't expect that. The doctor's offices are full of, of people that are uh, Christians that are sick. There's as many Christians in the doctor's offices as there are non-Christians. But you know what? That ought not be. That ought not be. I'm not saying the enemy won't come at us with sickness. 
But we need to stand up and say, no, I've been redeemed from that. I'm not like the, the man out there who's not a Christian. I, you have promised me, Lord, that you've taken my sicknesses and diseases. And so I don't have to bear it again. Lord, give me the strength, but I refuse these symptoms that are trying to come on my body. And then uh, many are, we're still failing many times to receive his loving kindness and compassion. We just feel so guilty and we spend so many hours just beating ourselves over the head when we should repent and then just start rejoicing over the fact that the, the blood of Jesus has set us free. And all of this is being offered to us by our Heavenly Father who loves us and has already paid the price. He's already done it for us. He's already given us these blessings. But they're just sitting there in a heavenly bank vault unclaimed. That's what They're just sitting there. Okay, do, I don't know many Christians uh, who are walking in all of these promises. But I'm saying that we need to start really making it our goal to walk in these promises. They're ours, and God is revealing them to us. And we need to say, Lord, I'm doing you wrong, Lord, when I don't receive and, and enjoy what you've already bought for me. Lord, help me to walk in these promises. That needs to be our goal as a Christian. That needs to be something that we say, Lord, I, I, don't, I may not can get there by myself, but Lord, with your help, I want to claim every single one of these promises. I want to walk in these promises. See, these promises are clearly spelled out in God's word, and God doesn't lie. If God offered us these promises in the word, they are true, but they're gonna, not going to do us one bit of good whatsoever until we decide to believe it and receive these promises by faith. Now, I've heard so many people say, well, sure, I believe those promises. I, I read that all the time. They said, no, they don't believe those promises. They'd be walking on them if they did. I want to tell God I believe these promises, but Lord, I know I'm not completely there. Help get me there. That needs to be our prayer. That needs to be where every day we say, Lord, I know these promises are true. And it shouldn't be that I'm enduring some of this because you've already bought and paid for it for me. Okay, here's another promise in God's word. After we've repented and after we put our sins under the blood, Isaiah 38, 17 tells us that he puts our sins behind his shoulder blades. I think that's such an, it's just a cute uh, scripture. I love it. But have you ever tried to see something that's behind your shoulder blades? You're not going to, you know, you can't. And so God's trying to give us a very graphic illustration of how he removes the sin the guilt and the consequences completely away from us where we can't even see it anymore, you know, after we've repented. It's behind his shoulder blades and he's not going to see it. But most Christians just go on suffering the consequences. I see most Christians, they just expect to, they, many times they've repented, they know they've repented, but they don't even give it a, a the tiniest little thought that they could be removed from the consequences. And then in the Old and the New Testament, God reminded us in Isaiah 43, verse 25, and also in Hebrews 10, verse 17, that he remembers our sin no more. Think about that. God says, when I forgive you, I don't even remember it anymore. Now, the world says, I can forgive you, but I can't forget. You know, you did it. I'm sorry, I can't forget. But God says, I don't even remember those sins anymore. They're gone. Now, the reason God can put our sins in the depths of the sea, the reason that he can hide our sins behind his shoulder blades, the reason he can put our sins from us as far as the east is from the west, the, remember, the reason he can remember our sins no more is because once we have truly repented, Jesus paid the price and those sins are not there anymore. They're just not there. God doesn't remember something that's not there. <laughs> And he tells us it's, it's been removed. It's been forgiven. Now, if I owed $100 to some store downtown and Pat decided that he was going to go down and he was going to pay my bill for me, you know. And so he goes down, he pays my bill. They would take that bill and they would mark it paid. They would file it away and it would never be remembered again because it was gone. It was paid. Or there'd be no debt to remember. Okay, that's exactly what Jesus did for us. Jesus paid our debt, so there is no debt to be remembered. Uh, and we'd see that in the natural. If somebody paid our debt in the natural, it's gone. Why do we not see it in the spiritual realm? All we have to do is believe it and receive it. And when we do, the Bible says that we are justified. 
I love whoever came up with that little deal that said justified means just as if I'd never sinned. I love that. See, there is no debt to remember if we're justified because it's just as if I'd never even committed that sin. Now, we can't understand that with our natural mind, but God in his infinite love, he has provided this kind of forgiveness for us. He's provided it, you know, and that's something we all want. Why is it that we have a hard time reaching out and receiving it in faith? Because the slate has been wiped clean. You know, I looked up the word forgiveness in Webster's Dictionary, and I was shocked at how much Webster understood about the God kind of forgiveness. I want you to listen to his definition. Number one, his dictionary says that forgiveness means to send something away. Number two, he says it means to completely cancel the debt. Number three, now this is Webster's dictionary. This is not out of the Bible. This is Webster saying forgiveness means the remission, the can cancellation, the release, and the dismissal of the debt and the consequences. That came out of the dictionary, you know. And number four, he said it means deliverance from the penalty of the sin. And number five, this is shouting ground. He said it means the complete removal of the cause. Listen, the only reason that we sin is because there was a root cause in each one of us. <clears throat> That's what caused me to sin, caused you to sin. But it, he removed the cause. God says, when I forgive you and when I do it my way, I'm going to remove the cause. Now, I realize that Webster knew a lot more about forgiveness than most modern Christians do. Most modern Christians have no idea that it means all of that. Now, when we repent and we receive God's forgiveness, a deliverance takes place. And that's why Romans 6 verse 11 says, realize now that you're dead to sin. God's telling us, realize it. You know, I've said it, I've done it, now realize it, you know. Uh, realize that the cause that made you sin in the first place has been delivered out of you. Now, the next time you receive God's forgiveness, carry it on out to its entirety because it's kind of like a checker game. God had the first move, and he's the one that made forgiveness available, you know, uh, through dying on the cross and offering us the new birth. And then after he made his move, it was our move, and now it was man's move to accept that gift, because we no longer then had to sin because the consequences have been removed. Now, the next thing is so important. Too many people receive being forgiven in their spirit. I want you to hear this because it's important. So many people, they'll receive being forgiven in their spirit, but they forget to receive the very next important move. God intends us to receive everything that has been offered in the physical realm as well as in the spiritual realm. And that's where a lot of people stop short. And until we accept the full package by faith in the physical realm as well as the spiritual, then uh, we're, we're not going to receive the removal of the consequences because we've received it in the spiritual realm, but we're not realizing it's done in the physical realm as well. And we'll keep walking in the consequences because we stop short. We, we haven't received the whole package. Now, I dare say that 90% or more of the Christian world has never walked in the fullness of what I'm, of what I'm showing you today. And I know that most of y'all know this, but you need a reminder. And uh, <clears throat> I think at least 90% of the Christian world, they have no idea uh, these truths that we're talking about tonight. But if we want everything that Christ has made available, we're going to have to have our minds renewed to see this in the Word of God. Because it's there so plainly. I mean, God said it in the Old Testament. He said it over and over and over in the New Testament. He wanted us to see it. He said it 500 years ahead of time in the Old Testament so that when Christ died, we'd say, oh, yeah, God told me about this 500 years ago. And then we have to choose to believe every one of these promises that I've just read out of the Scripture. We can't just know it and say, yeah, that's a truth. We have to say, I receive it. I take it into me. Now, I'm not saying that the enemy won't fight to keep you from having it. <clears throat> we live in a fallen world, and the enemy is alive and well in planet Earth. And so he's going to fight. But you know what? When we know that Christ has provided it for us, that gives us the strength then to be able to fight the enemy. We have the God of the universe on our side. And God says, if you believe my word, you can have it. You know, there was a young man. He came with teen mania 
uh, a few years ago with Ron Luz, and he gave his testimony out at the high school. And he told that when he was in high school, he had gotten drunk and he decided that he was going to go into the 7-Eleven store and he was going to hold them up and steal, uh, get a six-pack of beer. That's what he was after. Well, he was so drunk that when he got there, he decided, well, I might as well get the money out of the cash drawer. And he had, a, he had worn a pair of brass knuckles and he hit the man at the cash register, got his money and, and got his uh, six pack of beer. Well, the next morning he was arrested and he found out that during the night the man had died. Well, this young man that it happened to, he wasn't a bad guy, but he was devastated. He was absolutely devastated and he, he didn't know what to do. Well, once he got into prison, he started, got into the Word, and he finally accepted Jesus. He got born again, and he really got into the Word. He just started studying the Word and studying the Word. And he began to see these truths that we're talking about tonight. He started seeing them. He started marking them down. And he realized that not only had Jesus forgiven him of the sin, but that Jesus had taken the punishment. And he said he sat there and realized, he took this punishment for me. I don't have to bear this punishment again. And when he came to that realization and he started believing that promise from God's word, God set him totally free. Now, he travels all over the country preaching the good news, getting people saved, and telling how God now will actually remove not only the sin, but he will re remove the consequences of our sin if we'll believe it, if we'll take it and believe it. And I'm going to tell you what, that stretches most of our faith, but God wants it to be so real to us that when God says it's a truth in his word, that we say, well, of course I believe it. It's coming out of God's word. And a lot of people will say, well, that isn't fair that this young man didn't have to die for that sin. You know, somebody else died, so it's not fair. He should have died. Well, yes, in the natural, he did deserve to die. But they're just going to have to argue with God. <laughs> God's the one that turned him loose. Okay, this is God's word, and when we're willing to believe it and appropriate it, God will do exactly what he promised, and he wants us to start, try it out. I, maybe that's a bad way to put it, but he wants us to start, this is a promise from God's word, I'm going to put it to work. I know it's true, I'm going to put it to work. And we're going to find out that God will fulfill every promise if we'll believe it. It's a choice. And we can receive the full package if we want to, or we can pick and choose. We can say, well, I, I believe that he forgives my sin. I believe I'm going to go to heaven someday. But why not believe the whole thing? I knew one person who had been an alcoholic for years, suffered serious liver damage. He repented, he put it under the blood, and he was another one that started getting in the word and just, just uh, taking that word in. And he saw where the consequences were removed. And uh, for all those years that he had uh, taken in the alcohol, and uh, so he started believing God. One year later, he went back for a physical exam, and there was not one trace of liver cancer. And th these are true stories, you know. Uh, but they work when people have put them to work. They're not going to work if we don't put them to work, you know. But for the few who have put them to work, they're seeing unbelievable miracles. And it works if we believe it. Now, it's impossible in the natural, but God is wanting us to believe the word that with true repentance, even the consequences have been wiped away. And for years, we've probably confessed God takes the sin, he takes the guilt, and he takes the consequences. And so we say it, but it's not going to do as much good to say it if we don't reach out and say, I believe that. If God said it in his word, it's true. And that's what these two guys must have done. They must have said God said it. It must be true. I'm going to put it to work. And they saw the results. But we're going to have to make a choice. It's a choice when we come to the place where we say, Father, I'm just going to believe your word. I'm going to believe your word. And then we need to hang on to it tight because I can promise you, you're going to have a battle because the enemy's going to come and try to, to steal it. He's going to try to take it away. We live in a fallen world. But we have the greater one who lives in us if we'll hang in there. Now, most people have stopped to sin. They've repented and they believed God for forgiveness. But most have never even considered believing him for the removal of the consequences. Even though they may have said it, very few people have actually put that into practice. One of the biggest regrets I had was when we were building the house and we thought it was going to take a year. And it took us three and a half years because Jack was working full time and building. And one night it just dawned on me that... 
Angie and Bill, by the time we finished the house, all of their high school years were going to be over. They were going to be grown. They were going to be out of the house. And even though it hadn't been a sin to build a house, it was a, a wonderful gift that we got to build a house, the regret was so heavy that there were times that tears would just pour down my cheeks and I would think, oh, God, we've used up all of Angie and Bill's high school years. Well, finally, one day, God spoke so clearly to me, and he said, quit crying, put that regret under the blood, and believe me to change the circumstances. And I remember thinking, Lord, it's already too late. I mean, they're both fixing to graduate, you know, and uh, they're not young any longer. And I didn't see how on earth it was possible, but God kept dealing with me. And so I began to seriously appropriate the blood and Believe God to return the years that I thought were totally gone, you know. Well, after Angie got out of college in Tulsa, she moved back at home and stayed there until she was 26. Bill moved back home after he went to college. And I was shocked to realize that God definitely had returned the years that I thought the canker worm had eaten. And I thought, you know, they came back and they lived as long with us as they would have lived uh, through high school. And so we were able to have a lot more fun and good times together than we, would ever, than we ever would have had in their high school years because they'd have been busy in their high school years. And I remember thinking, Lord, you really did do something that was impossible. Well, God intended to go a lot past that. I think God has a sense of humor. I truly believe he has a sense of humor. And so when David and Angie married, after their, they uh, were through living in Irving. David was going to chiropractor school. They moved back home, and they lived with us while he was getting his practice started, which was a number of years. And then Bill and Sloan married. They moved to Houston, and they decided they would come back to Brownwood. They moved, and they moved in with us while they were getting established. And I remember thinking, wow, God's gone a little overboard, you know. <laughs> I'll tell you what, before it was over, I think with a smile on God's face, he was saying, do you think you've had your children living at home with you long enough now? <laughs> do you think I returned those years that you lost, you know? Seriously, we loved, we loved having it. it was, those are wonderful years that we remember. But I still think God was laughing and when he proved his point. When I thought it was too late, it's never too late for God. If we'll trust God, he can make things happen when it's impossible. <laughs> I mean, it was impossible that we weren't going to lose those years with our kids. Well, he showed us that he definitely had ways of going around the impossibility. Now, the world is going to come against us, and it's going to say that some things are absolutely impossible. And if we listen to the world, we're going to lose out. The world may say that something's impossible, but God has ways and means that the world has never heard of. Freely as we have received the promises of God, uh, we're going to realize that we need to teach this to our children. We need to teach other people that God's truths are there and they work. John 20, 23, the sins that you forgive will be forgiven. We can forgive the sins of others in Jesus' name and see them set free as well. Anytime someone is in sin, in guilt and consequences, they're going to keep on sinning as long as they think there's no hope. But when someone begins to proclaim the truth of God's word and somebody starts teaching it, then more people are going to start getting set free. More and more are going to get set free. Now, this is not just for the world. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, these truths can set us free. It's not just for us when we get to heaven. These truths can set us free in this life. Now, the prerequisite is true repentance, and if we'll walk in that true repentance and receive God's kind of forgiveness, we're going to find that every situation in our life can have a happy ending. And, you know, you think, no, we're living in a fallen world. Yeah, God has ways and means that, that we, we have to trust him, and we have to get around some of the problems that the enemy puts in our pathway, but God's word is true. And it gives us the power to see victory in the lives of people around us. It's amazing what Jesus is offering. And I think that's why it's called the good news. Now, I don't think many Christians have really realized what true forgiveness can actually do. Christ is offering it, but I don't think we've ever stopped to realize what that true forgiveness really means. It can change the course of our life. It can make all things new, just as if we'd never sinned, you know. But it's not automatic. It's something we have to believe and we have to receive in faith. But Christ is, God has made it so easy. All he's asked us to do is just believe it. You know, just choose to believe it. 
It's a fabulous gift beyond our fondest imagination, and it's just waiting for any of God's children who will reach out and receive it. It's just waiting.